Ross Griffin here. You guys all know me. Um, today we have a special guest with us, uh, Roger Barkley. Uh, he works with uh, us here in Cosmos. Ilya isn't here today, unfortunately. She's on a secret mission somewhere, but we'll get into that potentially later in our episodes. Today we're going to talk about cost modeling. Uh, not cost planning, not cost estimating, but cost modeling. And Roger is uh, quite experienced in this area, so he's going to walk us through uh, the next uh, half hour, 40 minutes. But first, Roger, maybe introduce yourself. Short answer, Roger, only, please. Okay. <laughs> Not sure if I'm capable of those, but I'll try. Um, I'm Roger. I'm a specialist at Cosmos. I've been in the construction industry full time since the mid 90s. I have kind of specializations in a few sort of more specialized areas mm. and more abstract or developing areas. I'm sure. the guy who knows far too much about things that normally bore people at parties and are only ever relevant maybe for a podcast like this. So. Yes. Okay. Interesting. So we'll see uh, if people actually log off after 10 minutes or not, but let's see how it goes, right? <laughs> yeah. But you, uh, your experience is from all over the world, uh, Roger. You spent, spent yeah. some time in the Middle East. and Yeah. yeah. I'm from England originally, but then I've been throughout the Middle East. And then in the Middle East, we had projects elsewhere. And then when we came here, we've had international projects. So a little bit in North America as well. When that was more when I was before I'd graduated some. So a, a bit of knowledge from all over the place in random things. So before we get into cost modeling, like in your opinion, over the last uh, 20, 30 years, uh, have, has the profession and the industry changed? Ooh. Yes, to say it's it's almost like a road with a lot of different lanes and some cars are going faster than other ones. Some are just creeping along. No change, please. We're happy with what we're doing. And other things are like the fast lane yeah. zooming along. So some things you see maybe decade to decade, some big changes, some things hardly moved an inch, mm -hmm. like some of the technologies, like if you go back to England, they're still using brick and block external cavity walls yeah. pretty much as they have for decades. Yeah, same in Ireland, actually. Uh, that, that's going to make another good uh, discussion at some point, actually, is uh, technology. But back to uh, our topic of today. So cost modeling we're going to, to talk about, as I mentioned. And we have kind of four kind of subcategories of, of, of our discussion for the next number of minutes. That is uh, kind of what is cost modeling? Um, I think we need to explain that for people, explain it for me, to be honest. Um, how does it work? Uh, how do we implement it on projects? What is the value add for cost modeling uh, to projects, to clients? And then the development of BIM and how is BIM now supporting that kind of early stage cost modeling uh, structure? But let's go back to that, uh, that first uh, point is, can you explain what is cost modeling to everybody listening? Yeah. The first thing you have to kind of deal with is even within a quantity surveying sort of realm, there's a misunderstanding of what it is because there's a term for cost modeling that a lot of people confuse with cost planning, which uh, it's a bit nuanced because ideally the cost model actually bleeds into the cost plan. So some people get confused because they're like starting their understanding at letter B instead of letter A. The other reason they don't really know about it is it comes from the developer's quantity surveyor's side of things who only make up a tiny percentage of all quantity surveyors. And then even within that group of quantity surveyors, it maybe only applies to about half because historically most developers either had a broad range of interests yeah. And they were the ones that kind of came up with cost modeling. And then there are people who have a very narrow band, say people who produce just apartments, who at any given time have a very good finger on the pulse of what is the cost, what is the selling, so they can do their business case calculation on the back of a box of cigarettes. But with people that had, where it kind of starts reading between the lines from what I learned over the years, it's like when spreadsheets came out like Excel and Lotus one, two, three, if anybody even remembers that <laughs> existed, that's like back in the nineties when that came out, the developers that had a broader interest had a much difficulter time getting their 
business case calculation to land where it should do. There was, it was a, a lot harder. So if you take, for example, where I kind of picked it up initially was with hotels. Yeah. Obviously you've got three, four, five star hotels. And even with hotels, you've got uh, city hotels, you've got coastal, you've got speciality hotels, ones that have villas or that are just self-contained. So there's quite a, even if you can't apply the same principle as say apartments just to hotels. No, because there's, all you there's a hotels. whole bunch of subcategories within the typography of hotels. Yeah. So it becomes very difficult to benchmark, if you like, across just hotels. As yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So what some bright spark had kind of realized when the Excel sheets had come out was that they could take all these bills of quantities that they had for all their different building types and they could extrapolate ratios. So external wall to floor area, internal wall to floor area, roof, they could calculate total length of pipe and then break that backward into average diameter of pipe, average diameter of cable. They could get to these get back to these initially these um key quantities mm, kind of granularity like. if you like yeah. yeah and then it's kind of once that initial model got built they realize that you can expand on it a little more you can go into say lighting fixtures air outlets uh, maybe valves you can break down um capacities of equipments and things so what kind of happened with the excel was it kind of develops over time where you get these ratios where you can put it into the model and based on your, if you've got a big enough database of historical data, you see that certain high-low trend patterns start to occur. So external water floor ratio between X and Y. So they can input that in, into the spreadsheet, play around with it a little bit, insert current day prices, and you end up with a business case stage, something that is in terms of accuracy closer to an outline design level estimate than the traditional i will just take a price per square meter so you're 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 i guess there's a scientific approach to it in one sense and then by by approaching in this level of detail you're reducing your risk of inaccuracy quite a bit i would say and the idea is as well that you can mix the two together so you still have your traditional benchmarking yeah. you can still try to figure what's in those benchmarks and adjust for your project so you have this top down approach yeah. but then the cost model is kind of a almost like a bottom up approach so you're then using the benchmarking to see does this make sense and then to fine tune it yeah so coming at it from both ends again to reduce that risk of inaccuracy within the calculation uh, but again basing it on I guess you would ha you will have to have some type of data in order to build that, as you mentioned, looking the bigger the database or data set you have on, let's keep with the typology hotels, the bigger the data set you have on your hotels, the more accurate you can become in that very, very early stage cost modeling, cost planning business case. With the, the other thing that you can do with it is in certain countries, there is sort of like um, a good practice guide, if you like, for um, the square meterages or the ratio of things. So, for example, with hotels, there may be a sort of a design requirement to, okay, the, the restaurant area should be a certain percentage of the overall square meters of the building, or it's predicated on so many square meters per uh, seat. And then the kitchen is normally a fixed percentage of that. So some of those you can base the square meters. If you're creating your hypothetical case for what your yeah. hotel might look like, you can get that sometimes just from those broad design yeah. outlines. Yeah. And you're kind of leading in to how does it work here in terms of linking between traditional benchmarking and then your cost modeling. But I, I guess for the QS is listening here, then, how would they approach that within their own organization for their clients? Again, keeping with the, the hotel analogy. There's almost no excuse not to do it if you are, maybe to look at it this way, if you are the type of customer that has one, one or two specific types of buildings. So if you were, say, 
logistics or data centers. Yeah. So if you're a business that produces pretty much the same kind of warehouse throughout the country, throughout the region, throughout the world, you've got, you should have received tons of bills of quantities that you could either yourself or have somebody generate you the model. And then if you want to have your finger on the pulse, you could just get somebody to price the model every year just to see where that's going. So you can do your five, 10 year plan. Okay. Put some inflation to it. What's the current price? And it'll be more accurate. So for the QS is listening, then I guess, uh, it's the same old story that data is, is key to, to cost modeling. You need data and, and that should theoretically, if you want to start with cost modeling, you need to start with your data collection. Yeah. For the older practices that have the old paper BQs or whatever, they'll still have a massive database. Their problem is that it's going to be across too many building types and you have to build a model per building type because the ratios are just, not just the Swings. ratios are mm. different, but also the, the good, the outline kind of practices of what should be canteen area, what should be landlord area, what should be entrances, toilets is different for each building type. So you, you can't just have a one size fits all. It needs to be per building type. So if it's a traditional uh, quantity surveying practice, they almost want to start by saying, I've got the most data and the most work out of this type. Mm. I've got tons of BQs. So I will generate my first model based on this, yeah. see how that goes and then progress across. Um, and of course, it's not just hotels we're talking about. It's, it's all typologies. And I guess defining those typologies you could look at the ICMS, International Construction Measurement Standards, in terms of a pi uh, typology definition. That standardization becomes, again, important when collecting this data. So we've looked at kind of what is cost modeling. We understand that it's a, a bottom-up approach to uh, cost planning. Um, it's based on the data you have collected for that typology and, and, and subcategories. Um, how it works is it's a two-pronged approach then in this early stages. So you're coming from the left with your benchmarking and from your right with your cost modeling. That's reducing the risk of inaccuracy, obviously much better for the client. It's then off on you quite a, a large granularity from which then to develop the project from into the traditional cost plan. into the exactly into the traditional cost plan and then cost estimating etc to the project life cycle but you know, if we didn't jump to kind of item three on our on our list here of four um what's the value add um for clients in, in this in this cost modeling scenario at this very early stage there's a lot and it kind of depends who the client is so in one instance, as I was talking about with the developers, their problem was that obviously they are building a project for financial reasons. So they want to achieve a certain percentage. And if they are operating in an area where there's too much variance in where they're going to land as a end cost, they really want to tighten up on that at the business case stage, because sometimes the margin might be so tight that that error of margin in the traditional benchmarking way of doing things that you're basing your whole business model on can be so far out that it, you wouldn't have decided to build it. Yeah. The other thing is that maybe to get towards how it's useful to other clients and also to designers. One is that it allows you to game out different scenarios. Mm. So, once you have the model, if, if you're a designer and you're doing a volume study, you want to test two or three different ideas with a fair, quite quickly with a fair degree of accuracy. But then there's also uh, issues of being able to value engineer at an exceptionally early stage. Yeah. Without a design, it becomes quite difficult, right, to value engineer yeah. to a certain degree. Because the ratios themselves also speak back to you. So you get a someone throws an idea on the table and maybe it's within budget, but straight away you're saying to the guy, okay, but just so you're aware, this design would result in you being at the high end of the scale or beyond it for a couple of these things. Facade to gross floor area, for yeah. example, as a ratio. So, I mean, you can 
have a building that's 100 square meters and on the most extreme it's one meter by 100 or you can have it 10 by 10. I mean that's the most like extreme example you can get but just getting back to that point when the ratios speak to you and you say well if you pull that back in this gives you more money here and the thing that I found kind of almost caught designers unaware was if we did that that would give you this much money what would you do with that that you feel is of greater value and when I said that to some of the um, architects that I was working with at the time I can remember the one actually kind of sat back in his chair almost like he was surprised that I was you were handing back yeah I wasn't cutting (laughs) money off him I was saying you can do that but if we did rain back on these a little because it's not cost efficient maybe it's a sign of not cost efficient design if we pull it back in you'll get this much back would you want to spend it here would you want to spend it there or is there something that you know from your conversation with the client or if you are a client that you're thinking i could put this in because there there is this kind of other side to it that when an engineer or an architect designs he either designs something and kind of just hopes it comes in by budget or he instinctively reigns back to what he thinks is on budget because it's not necessarily his field of expertise and he normally cannot get that level of feedback so there's this question of well if you're reigning back but you can get this level of detail how much of the design are you leaving off the table that you could be feeding back in and this is really what we talk what kind of we describe when we say value-driven cost management, right? Value-driven means that this collaborative approach with the design team in the early stages is allowing design designers to make decisions that have a, a, a value creation for the project, not just designing. Um, and it sounds like by implementing this cost modeling approach in the early stages allows us then to assist the design team on their decision-making Again, taking va- taking cost out of somewhere that's cost inefficient and taking that value and implementing it somewhere else, depending on what the client or the design team want. That's a huge value add to the yeah. project for sure. And this is something that you can be, and the emphasis here, you can be doing it at business case stage. Yeah. So if you only have a vague idea what your budget is mm-hmm. and you just want to game out, what can I actually achieve with this? Mm-hmm. Or if you're... Uh, doing it commercially because you want to achieve a certain percentage you can game out different ideas you can have a much more concrete idea of what you should be able to build Mm -hmm. instead of this vagueness that kind of exists in the business case stage and another just to kind of finish it off another part of it is because it generates quantities it also means that you are capable of producing a, a high level of detail of a uh, carbon assessment. Yeah, I was just going to go there, yeah. yeah. Even if you want to see at that business case stage, what would the carbon profile of this idea, this idea, or this idea look like? And you have the opportunity to value engineer the cost and the carbon, and you're doing it at a stage before a lot of parties have got involved, a lot of hours have been expended because it's all too late if you get to end of outline or detailed design and whoops, we're over budget. So the redesign element at that sketch stage is, is minimal. So the only real kind of investment from a client's perspective is additional hours on this cost modeling, which in comparison to a full design team redesign at detailed design because we're over budget or we're over our carbon targets, um, there it's a completely different world, really. Yeah, it's the kind of thing you build one time you put a little effort into updating it so it's kind of like an an upfront cost but if you are the kind of business that is producing buildings on quite a regular basis then just the hours you potentially save on one to two just one project that doesn't work well you've potentially saved more hours than you've expended on the model and I think that's that's super important for for large repeat clients who are multi-asset owners, uh, multi-investors. You're really standardizing and structuring your approach across your entire portfolio and business, not just singular projects here. We're not just talking about hotels. We're talking about 
everything and anything when it comes to the building typology. And I think that's kind of leads in quite nicely, actually, into our fourth point here is how is the movement and transitioning uh, to BIM, building information modeling, building information man management going to assist now with this cost modeling approach? How does that all tie together? The thing with the BIM, and this was something that uh, maybe if you're going to talk about some of Ilya's secret missions, there are people kind of asking, not about this because they're not aware that it sort of exists, but they're asking questions about what more can we extract from BIM? How can we be more helpful? How can we incre increase the value add? And this is a conversation that's been raised to people that to be able to, once they've set it up in the BIM, it's a relatively straightforward process to extract the ratios that you need to start just to have the initial framework or to have over time a more developed framework. So really here we're talking about extracting data and information from the the, the design and solutions. Again, we in a structured, standardized way, because it's not just the extraction of data here, it's the extraction within standardizations. And then being able to use that standardized data in the future to be able to build automate, potentially, yeah. not only the cost modeling, but also the design solutions. Yeah. I know there's a, a, some companies looking at this in relation to early stage planning and density solutions on, on sites where they have this uh, this particular process automated. So you can adjust your number of units and size of units and it'll automatically update the models for you. And of course, we're working quite heavily with the fifth dimension in terms of that data extraction from, from projects, not as an extraction of a, something you do, but actually your day-to-day -day process of kind of, I guess, uh, data kind of implementation on the project. So when we talk about BIM, we're not just talking about 3D and design, we're talking about information relating to the project, like project location, typology, quality levels. Is it a one star or five star hotel? That's hugely valuable. Hospitals, you know, is it just beds we're talking about? Or are we talking about operation facilities, etc. within hospitals? All of this information becomes hugely valuable in your cost modeling. If we can collect that information from the project along with your ratios, as you talk about, along with your cost aspect that is associated directly with the relationship of ratios, then we will end up being able to automate the cost modeling process in the future. The traditional BQ format or the ICMS format or whatever you're following, it's just a format in its current form. It doesn't give you the data you need, which is why the BIM can at least automate it so it saves you one action of having to go through your BQ and kind of extract everything yourself. It can, and particularly, I think with the carbon, it's going to be a lot more useful because when you want to evaluate the carbon at early stage, there's not a great deal of value or use in saying that the carbon's in the substructure, the superstructure, whatever, because then that then just begs the question, where? Where? it's actually more important to see where the carbon is inter and group it by building materials. So again, when you talk about what BIM can do and in terms of ratios, that, it, that extraction will become increasingly valuable. And, I, and, and it, it, it's, that's an interesting kind of side to it. Cost management of courses and our process is directed with quantity extraction. The calculation of carbon is obviously directed direct link with with, uh, with quantities as well. So the QS is in a very good position here to kind of manage both of those processes, but that mapping then from quantum into material quantum and, and that next layer down becomes vitally important in terms of decision making for your LCA in the future and your embodied carbon, whether it is green concrete or green steel or whatever the situation or the, the case may be. So, um, so very interesting. So it sounds like this approach to cost modeling has a huge value add for clients in the early stages. It also sounds like we might be able to automate a lot of this in the future, which is very interesting. But of course, we won't be able to just automate it. We will need to be able to structure how we automate it. And data collection becomes very important for, for us on our projects. 
So for any young QSs or QSs out there looking to get involved in this, it really, our conversations are continually coming back to information and data. We need this information and data from your existing projects in order to be able to facilitate quality in future projects. Yeah. And it seems, that seems to be missed a little bit at the moment. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of opportunities that are kind of missed because of the historical way that we've done yeah. things. So another, another an example of that, that actually fits with what you can do with the cost modeling as a side exercise is the VE2. Yeah. The, the traditional value engineering is most people just use it for cost cutting, just yeah. cut it off. And the, it tends to be binary. Do you want to do this? Yes or no. Mm -hmm. Instead of having the third option, which is maybe because with the cost modeling, once you've, got to something that you're comfortable with you can still run the scenarios to see what the potential cost savings could be and mix them play around with them so you can use that and then feed that into your v2 yeah so, so value engineering too just yeah. for anybody listening there and if 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 you don't know what that is we have animations done on that and you just jump on our linkedin page the cosmos linkedin page and you can have a look at those animations they explain really what value engineering one and value engineering two are but yeah sorry roger yeah so with the value engineering two you are the maybe is kind of the the governing thing it's something that you don't necessarily want to do but if push comes to shove you might use it it gives you additional protection and it gives you the choice do i expend some of my contingency or do i want to use one of these value engineering maybe options and you can assign that to a timeline program of the latest date by which you could instruct that change and you can actually scale back your contingency fee based on that so you don't have to try and sit on a lump of cash the whole time. So so basically, really, that cost modeling in the very early stages is setting your entire strategy for your project before ever de a design is there. You can potentially identify drivers within the project to focus value engineering on, whether it's value engineering one, yes or no, or value engineering two, maybe. And your entire strategy really kind of is formed out of this cost modeling approach. So uh, rather than, again, cost planning, which is square meter pricing or pricing what's in front. Excellent. But um, so very good. I think uh, just to recap on, on kind of what we, we discussed there, it was cost modeling, what it is, how it differs from cost planning, how it really adds value, how you would implement it on a project, um, what the qualities are, I guess, and the information that you need for it. Um, that's something key, and I think everybody should be thinking about this. Um, that value creation for clients, obviously, is is massive, as you described. You know, reducing the risk in an early stage with very little investment at that point uh, has to be hugely beneficial for, for our clients. And, of course, the future is, is data, and the future will be uh, the automation of this. Um, which is super exciting. But um, but I think thank you very much for your time today, Roger. I think it was uh, really cool to talk about this particular unknown aspect, if you like, of quantity surveying and, uh, and our cost control process on projects. Yeah. Thanks very much for listening. There's a LinkedIn link below in the show notes. We would love to connect with you. We hope you enjoyed it and uh, have you with us in the next one. Thank you very much.